Um, and in the case of the church in Rome, he's not very happy with them. There are a lot of issues in this church that he, he has to address and, and, and he has to teach them through. And these first three chapters, he really just jumps right into it. And he starts off by saying, these are all the things that you guys are doing that are not good, that are not of Christ. So the, the overarching theme of these three chapters is our unrighteousness. So first he deals with the, the unrighteousness of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles namely were just people who were not Jews. Um, so that's all of us. Uh, then, as we see uh, in, well, starting last week in, in today's passage, he deals with the unrighteousness of the Jews, and finally he's going to wrap everything up in chapter 3 with the unrighteousness of all people. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, now, I don't say this to apologize for the book. I don't say this to make excuses for the book. Um, on the contrary, this is something that we need. We do need these messages. We do need uh, the, these letters from Paul to tell us where the church falls short, where we as followers of Christ fall short, have fallen short, and will fall short. And there's a purpose behind this. You know, the, uh, the second song that we sung today, um, Sunday's Coming, I never heard that one before. I really liked it. Um, and I just thought that was so apt for, for what we're talking about today because when we're going through passages like this, when we're going through these first three chapters of Romans, it feels like Friday because we're just getting hammered over and over again by Paul telling us all these things that we're doing wrong. But this book, this letter is not made up of just three chapters. Something is coming. This message that Paul has for us is necessary, but it is not the whole message. Sunday is coming, but we need to get through Friday first. So this message of Romans is incredibly necessary, and it's also a countercultural message. Uh, now it's not countercultural for the sake of being countercultural. We're not being rebellious for the for the sake of being rebellious. Uh, but no, this message is countercultural for the sake of having us understand that we were created for the glory of God when the culture is telling us that we exist for our own glory. So since this is going to be a, a fairly heavy passage, I, I want to take a minute to pray one more time before we get into this. Uh, pray for myself and pray for, for all of you that we would just hear the Lord speak this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, I thank you for Sunday. I thank you for this Sunday that we have this time that we get to come together and we get to worship together and fellowship and, and sit at the teaching of your word. And Lord, I just thank you for your promises. That you will see us through our, our struggles and you will see us through our trials and you will not let our unrighteousness, you will not let our sin go unchecked, but that you have an answer for it. And the answer is you. So Lord, I pray as we're going through this passage, first I pray for myself that, that as I'm speaking, Lord, that these wouldn't be my own ideas, these wouldn't be my own opinions that I'm speaking, but it's just a demonstration of the Spirit. Anything that I say that, that comes from me would just be forgotten, Lord. So that the only thing that's left is you, your words, and your glory. And Lord, I want to pray for this church. I, I thank you so much for this church, a church who seeks after you. And, and Lord, I pray as we're hearing this message from you, that it would hit our hearts. And that we would be radically changed. We would be radically transformed by your word. God, we thank you for all the ways that you bless us. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. And we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. In your name we pray, amen. So, 
Uh, if I haven't mentioned it already, we are working through our word of the year, which is to be transformed. Um, now, I did kind of break the mold on things this morning. I know all of our sermon titles have had the word transform in it. Um, I didn't really feel like shoehorning the word transform into the title of today's sermon um, because very simply, today's sermon is entitled, No One is Exempt from Obedience. And if I could start with my first point right out of the gate, the, the first point that I want to get across is just because we are not under the law, it doesn't mean that we are above the law. So, so Paul starts this passage off and, and he's addressing the Jews. He's addressing the Jews, people who, who hold the law, and typically in the modern church, whenever we hear the word Jew, whenever we hear the, the word law, we kind of tune things out because we think, all right, I'm not Jewish, uh, the law is old news, we're done with it, let's move on. Let, let's talk about something that's relevant to us. Um, but in reality, this actually has a great deal to do with us. So let's, let's deal with the, the first part, Paul talking to Jews. So Paul, in this particular instance, is speaking to Jews. He's speaking to Jewish Christians, uh, people who, who have who have had an encounter with Christ, they have decided that, that he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, and they are going to follow him. So there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt of who he's speaking to right now in, in this particular passage. But what we really need to do to understand what's going on here is we have to understand who the Jews were in the context of the culture right now that Paul is speaking to. So the Jews were simply people who have been given the special revelation of God himself, which is what the law is, which is what the word of God is, the special revelation. Now, remember, there are two different kinds of revelation, and Nick spoke on this maybe last week, a couple weeks ago, um, where there is first this, this general revelation, and this is something that is uh, made... made um, uh, made known to everyone, where it's this, this, this idea that everything that God has created declares God. It declares his glory. It declares his majesty. It declares that there is a God who exists that created everything. And, and everyone is born with this. Whether or not they, they know Christ, it, it is a part of everyone. It's part of us being made in the image of God, uh, which is what Nick was speaking about when he's, he was talking about the Gentiles who did not have the law were still accountable for their worship of God because God had given them something in them to, to declare that God is, is, is the one that created them, that God is the one who has all authority and power over earth. So that's general revelation. But then we have special revelation, uh, which is God specifically revealing himself to his people through his word, through prophecy, through dreams namely the word of God. This book right here is the special revelation of God. So if we look at the, the words that Paul is using in these chapters, he's speaking to Gentiles and he's speaking to Jews, but if we look at the message of these chapters, ultimately Paul is speaking to people without the special revelation of God and people with the special revelation of God. Or more simply, people who have not known God and people who have known God. Now we see that when we break things down to these two classifications, we actually identify a lot more with the Jews than we do with the Gentiles. Because we, as Christians, as people who are followers of Christ, have been given that same special revelation of God. And now we are a part of the same group as these Jewish people as well. So we are part of the group of God's chosen people. God's elect, as they are sometimes referred to. Now I'm not here to talk about how we become elect and, and really what that means and all the different theories and, and theological studies that talk about what does the elect mean. But I think we can, we can confidently say that the elect are people who have been called by God to follow God, and they have answered that call. So that should be us. That should be the church. Because of the sacrifice 
of Jesus Christ on the cross, there is no longer a distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. We have all been grafted into God's chosen people so that we all have the same relationship with the Father that the Jews always had. So there is no longer this this distinction between Gentile and Jew, but rather the distinction is people who are with God and people who are without God. Now, let's turn our attention to the law. The other thing that we tend to want to ignore sometimes. Now, when we talk about the law in the New Testament, we're not talking about a new law. The law has not been redefined into something new. It doesn't mean the New Testament. This is the same law that, that has always been. It's the same law that was written on our hearts uh, since, since we are created in the image of God. It was the same law that was given to Moses and the Israelite people a few thousand years ago. The law has not changed, and the value of the law has not changed. But our relationship with the law has changed. Now, I will explain that in in just a minute, but there are a few things that I think we need to get through first. When I say our relationship with the law hasn't changed, it it doesn't mean that we are above it or we can ignore it now. Um, We are no longer subject to the law because Christ has fulfilled the law. There's a caveat to that. So first the question is, what was the purpose of the law? So we know that in the beginning, I know I'm going all the way back to Genesis. Uh, Nick warned me against this, but we're doing it anyway. In the beginning, when God created everything, he created man, and he created man to glorify God. We were created to glorify him. We were created to be Uh, in fellowship with him, we were created to worship him, we were created to enjoy him. But the problem is, there was this thing that was introduced to man called sin. Uh, It was introduced to man by man. Uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord, introduced sin in the world, and it broke this fellowship. It broke this image of God that we were created with, and it made it so that we were no longer able to glorify God the way that we were meant to the way that we were created to. We were no longer able to have that same fellowship and made us incapable of doing what we were created to do. Sin caused man to do what was right in his own eyes instead of what God had declared was already good. And as a result, man sought his own righteousness apart from God, and that was never going to work. So because of this, God gives us the law. And the law was to show us how things should be. The law was to show us how we are to worship. It shows us how we are to love God. It shows us how we are to glorify God. It shows us how we are to present ourselves as blameless and clean before God. And it shows us how we are to love one another. But the main purpose of the law was to show us that we cannot follow the law. The purpose was never to save us because the law is impossible for us to live up to. Now, some of us might hear that and and say, well, that's not fair. Why would God give us a a law that we can't follow? Because the law shows us that we have always, will always, fall short of what God expects, demands, and deserves from us. The law is there to show us that the only hope that we hope that we have to please God is with God. Therefore, God sends his son Jesus to fulfill that law. So Jesus lives a sinless life that we could not live. He takes on the full weight of our sin and satisfies the wrath that we earn for ourselves in our rebellion against God. So that, uh, uh, sorry, he... He was to be a perfect sacrifice that atones for our sin so that if we repent, if we turn from our sin and we follow him, we would be justified by his righteousness instead of our own unrighteousness that leads to eternal death and separation from God. Note that what is said is that Jesus fulfills the law. Jesus tells us that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but fulfill it. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, Looking at verses 17 and 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law 
or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an, io not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So Jesus does not render the law ineffective. He does not render it obsolete. Rather, what Jesus does is he does what we cannot. He fulfills the law. He does the things of the law that are required for righteousness that we were never able to do. And in that, it, ch it changes our relationship with the law. So instead of seeking imperfect rest through our imperfect obedience to the law, we find our rest in Jesus Christ, in his work. Instead of relying on sacrifices for momentary spiritual cleaning, we have been made clean once and for all by Christ's perfect sacrifice. The same, same standard of righteousness still applies, but now we stand on the righteousness of Christ rather than our own. And that has, is how Jesus fulfilled the law. But it's also important to note that cleanliness and righteousness is not the only thing that the law addressed. There's also the idea that we are to love God and love people, and this is something that the law demonstrates for us to do. It shows us how we are to love God properly and how we are to love God's people properly. And this is an aspect of the law that is ongoing. Now, if we go to Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that be goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So his word shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish, accomplish its purpose. Its purpose in showing us our sin and its purpose in showing us how we are to love God and we are to love those who God loves. And this is best demonstrated in the Ten Commandments, which Jesus summarizes by saying there are two commandments. That we would love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our might. And we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus breaks down the whole law into two sentences. Love God, love people. And we see that this is a foundation of Jesus Christ's ministry and message. So no, we are not done with the law. Never think that this doesn't apply to you, either of these words. When the Bible refers to the Jews, it refers to the people that God has chosen to call his, of which you have been grafted into if you call yourself a follower of Christ. And when the Bible refers to the law, never think that it's an outdated law that means nothing, but know that it is a law that our Savior has fulfilled. And he fulfilled it so that we may be free from the burden of the law and free to live out the love of the law. So now that we've gotten all, through all that, let's actually get into our passage today. So Paul is writing to the Jews, to you who have the law, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, on the law boast in the Lord. And, and what he does is he, he lists out these different experiences, uh, experiences and these different blessings that the Jews had because of their relationship with the Lord. A relationship that no one else had up until this point. So they've been given the special revelation of God. They have been shown the character of God. They have been shown what is good and what is true. They, they know the will of God. They have been taught by his law. They have been taught by his word. And they have been given the responsibility and the honor to instruct others to, uh, to accomplish his law and his word. See, the Gentiles had a general knowledge of God, but the Jews knew him intimately. And how much more set apart should they already be? 
See, they're not starting from scratch. When these Jews decided that they were going to follow Jesus, they did not start following a new God. He's the same God that they have always known. Because the law of the Lord has not been abolished, everything they always knew about God still stands. They should be the most transformed. You know, we've said over and over again, over the past few months, that the gospel transforms us. Any encounter with the Lord should produce a response in us that is contrary to our sinful nature. And that is the expectation that Paul had for these Jewish Christians. Because these people have had this special, this special re- relationship and have had this special revelation of the Lord in his law that no one else had, it should have produced a work in these people. It should have produced a holiness and a humility in them that was not seen in the Gentiles. It should have produced a a holiness that would make them more in tune with the will of God and with the character of God. And that character should have begun to manifest itself in them. In the same way that, you know, if we spend a lot of time with a certain person, if we spend a lot of time with a certain group of friends, we start picking up some of those mannerisms and we start... You know, we have these, these inside jokes that, that these people that we spend a lot of time with understand and no one else does. In the same way, if we spend a lot of time with the Lord, we should start picking up these different characteristics of the Lord. And since they have the law that shows them their unrighteousness, it should have also produced a humility in them. That even though they continually fall short of the glory of God, he still chose to call them his. And if that doesn't humble you, I don't know what will. Now it also should have enabled them to be teachers and instructors to these new followers of God. To these Gentiles that now have experienced Christ and, and have become part of their worship. says that they are to be a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So it's, it's the same way that a parent would instruct a child, right? So why do we teach our children? It's, it's not out of obligation. It's not, it's not something that we have to do, but rather we do this because we love our children. We want our children to grow up respectfully, and, and we want them to be—we uh, want them to do what is right. We want them to be successful. Now, it doesn't mean that we have everything together. Um, it, it doesn't mean that we know what we're doing as parents. Uh, any parent in this room can tell you that they're just flying by the seat of their pants most of the time, um, and that's why kids pick up things from you that you don't want them to. But it happens anyway. But it's not because we have everything figured out, but we have been blessed with our own experience and instruction that we can pass on to our children. We're not perfect. We're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find some bread. And it's important to know that these expectations are for anyone who is in the body of Christ. This is not an expectation for for just a pastor or a ministry leader or a worship leader or a Bible study leader. Anyone who has spent any amount of time in the church should be doing these things. The characteristics of God should be manifest in anyone who is in the church. The instruction of new Christians should be something that everyone in the church should be doing. It's not something that you just get around to. It's an expectation for all of us. And unfortunately, this is not something that we see in the Jews in this church. So we look at our our second point. Our second point is that possession of the gospel is not the same as profession of the gospel. See, there are two big problems with this group of people that Paul is, is talking to right now. Their first problem is that their confidence came from the fact that they were Jews and that they had the law. So they had this mindset that they were first called God's chosen people. They had the law first, so therefore God is not going to send us to hell because we're special. 
They had it in their minds that because of who they were, that that was enough to save them. The gospel's for the Gentiles, but it wasn't necessary for the Jews. Now, we see this argument all the time that if God loves us, then he wouldn't send us to hell, right? See, we hear that argument because we wrongly assume that God is going to be man-centered. We assume that God is going to change and act based on what is best for us, what makes us feel good, what allows us to do what we want to do. We think that his main focus is to glorify those that he loves. And if he truly loves us, then he would allow us to live in the ways that we see fit because his love for us is greater than his love for his own justice and his own righteousness. But the truth is that God is God-centered. God's main priority is his own glorification. It's not arrogant. It's not two-faced. It's just. Because God is deserving of all glory and all honor. See, we were created for his glory. He does not exist for our glory. We were created to magnify his goodness and his righteousness And if we refuse to do so, then we cannot dwell in his presence. But thankfully, one of the ways that God does choose to glorify himself is by how he loves us. Now, he doesn't deny us, or he doesn't love us by denying his justice or his goodness. Again, if we're going to go back to this analogy of how we train up our children, it's the same way. Loving our kids doesn't mean letting them do whatever it is that they want. Because we know that the things that kids want for themselves are terrible for them. Luke would never eat a vegetable if it were up to him. It would just be cookies and chips and boogers. I don't know. Um, Luke would not make the decisions that, that are good for him. If it were all up to Luke, he wouldn't make it past 10. Now, I love Luke, so I don't let him do all the things that he wants, but also because I love Luke, I also discipline him. It's not fun. No parent likes to discipline their kid, but we do it because it's necessary. And we do it because ultimately it's going to keep them from doing the things that are going to hurt them. We do it because it's necessary. So when God looks at us, when he looks at at his creation, when he looks at the Jew and he looks at the Gentile, his standard of righteousness is the same for everybody across the board, for the Jew and the Gentile. So the Jews were not automatically saved because of their title or because they had the law. They needed the gospel just as much as the Gentiles did. But they didn't see it that way. Now that's their first problem. Their second problem is that they boasted in the law, but they didn't even obey it. They wanted to be these, these morality police that's, that could you know, shake a finger at all the, all the irreligious Gentiles and say, you're horrible, you're sinful, you're going to hell because this, this, and this. But they don't even practice what they preach. They had the law, they had it memorized frontwards and backwards. And it had no effect on them. They were hypocrites. And their hypocrisy defiled the name of God before the Gentiles. See, they claimed that it was their possession of the law that made them better, and that was what saved them, but they didn't even bother to live it out. They expected people who didn't know God to live like God, while they, who supposedly knew God, lived like the world. It says, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? And then Paul gives this pretty intense condemnation where he says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Uh, sorry, because of how the, these Jewish Christians chose to live, they, char- they tarnish, tarnished the reputation of God to the people around them. 
Now, my question is, church, how often do we do this? How often do we expect the title of Christian to be what saves us? Because we grew up in the church. Because my dad was a deacon. Because I go to church myself sometimes. I listen to Christian radio. I have a Bible verse tattoo. You know, these are all nice things, but it's not what saves you. And do we blaspheme the name of God because we consider ourselves superior to people who sin differently than us? We may sin differently, but we're all still sinners. Your sin may be small in the world's eyes, but it's still a sin that leads to death. No title, no good work will ever exempt us from needing a savior. No title, no good work will ever exempt us from needing the gospel. Which brings us to our, our final point. Point number three, we mustn't dwell in our sin, but we must acknowledge it. So this is, this is a hefty passage. And we've said time and time again as we're going through Romans that Romans is a letter. It's not a, it's not a book. It, it didn't have chapters. It didn't have verses. It's a letter that Paul wrote to this church that was meant to be read all the way through from start to finish. Yeah, we break it down in, into these small bite-sized pieces because, I mean, there's just so much to talk about. That's why it's taken us three months to get through two chapters. But the problem is, when we look at these small sections, it's really easy to miss the hope of the message. Romans, in a lot of ways, is a lot like the law in that it shows us how we fall short. It shows us how we are nothing compared to the glory of God. And how there's nothing that we can do to glorify him. And no matter what we call ourselves, who we call ourselves, no matter what we do, we are sinners destined for eternal wrath. Now that is true, but it's only half the truth. Remember, Sunday is coming. God's message is not that we are sinners and there is no hope for us. God's message is that we are sinners and he is the hope for us. See, it's important that we do acknowledge our sin. It's important that we do go through these passages that show us who we really are. How we cannot stand up to the righteousness, to the, to the expectations of God. Now, there's a danger in, in reading these, these passages in, in such small snippets because it can cause us to have several different reactions. We can look at this and we can just say, all right, well, this is really mean. It's uncomfortable. I don't like this, so I'm just going to ignore it. The Bible it, it has nothing for me. I'm just going to go live my life. There's another response that we can have that, that we can look at it and say, okay, Yes, other people sin, but I sin too. So who am I to say anything about anyone else's sin? And we kind of have this sin and, and let sin mentality. But the purpose is not that we would just ignore other people's sins so that other people will ignore ours. But the purpose is that we would examine our lives, that we would compare our lives to Christ and see that we don't measure up and that we would chase after him because he has made a promise that he will make us righteous. That he bought and paid for every single sin that you have committed and will commit. And his sacrifice was enough. We can't out the grace of the Lord. So instead of ignoring sin, what, what we should do instead, say that we have been freed from our sin, no longer chained to our evil desires, and encourage one another to walk in obedience. Not because this obedience saves us, but because we have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ that we may walk in his way. 
that we walk in life instead of death. These passages are necessary because it shows us our need for a Savior. that we would stop trying to earn our righteousness by ourselves, so that we would stop trying to, to live on our own good works and, and just accept the fact that we can't do it, but we have a God who will do it for us. And all it takes is for us to just repent and follow him. That we would follow him not just as Savior, but also as Lord. That we say, God, I am giving you everything. I am giving you my life, and I am giving you my obedience because you have promised, and you keep your promises. Your promises are good. So I I pray that, church, if if this is something that you've been struggling with, if this is something that that you found yourself getting in the habit of, I, I pray that you would. Bring it before the Lord. Now, he is, he is not a, a God who, who likes to keep himself from us. He is not a God who, who will make us jump through hoops in order to earn his forgiveness. But he is a God who gives his forgiveness freely. All we do is submit. And, and if this is something that you've never done, if, if you've never considered the Lord, if if you've been trying to do things on your own, if you've been trying to make yourself a good person and you realize you're just running in circles, you're just running in place, we have a God who died for you. He died a death that you deserved so that you would not have to. Not out of obligation, but out of love. This is a free gift for all of us. All we do is submit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you have given your word freely. Thank you that you have given your word openly so that we might know you. We might know your character. We might know your promises. We might know your goodness we might know what you have done to save us. Because we couldn't save ourselves. But you did this freely, you did this openly because you love us. So God, I pray for this church, I pray that we would chase after you, that, that our obedience to you would be evident and I, and I pray that we would obey not, not because we feel like it makes us better, but because we have been freed from our sin. God, I thank you that you do not forsake us. I thank you that your grace is enough and that it never runs out. God, we thank you just for all the ways that you bless us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice. It's your name we pray. Amen.